High time you got back here, you negligent ninny, deserting the ship when all hands were needed. When I wake up in the morning in the laundry of water, I don't think I'll ever make it on time. By the time I grab a brush and I give myself a look, I'm at the morning in the sun. Bye, bye, Well, the beard is gone. <laughs> I shave it off every once in a while just to check on what my face looks like. And as per usual, I was grossly disappointed. So how y'all doing? How you doing, Brad? This is falling apart. Things are not going well here at What Shall I Cry Ministries. For one thing, I can't find my glasses. And another thing, we're all discombobulated. <laughs> Believe it or not, we've got a system here. And the system got all messed up. We do everything on this little laptop, and it's a delicate system. One little mishap, and the whole thing just kind of crumbles. So I got all confused in the scheduling. So we're just going to kind of start over here. Now, when the show opens, you might notice a strange music. That music is from an obscure television show, usually from the 80s or 90s. It's just kind of fun, for me anyway. As I've said, some of the things we look at here are pretty terrible to look at. This is just kind of a way that you know, helps me get through it in a stupid little kind of way. If you recognize the theme music and are the first to guess correctly in the comments, you'll win a prize, and Brad will tell you what the prize is. And it's always a good prize, right, Brad? Nope. And then after Brad reveals the prize, I'll fill you in on the answer to the previous episode's theme music. See, it's like a system. <laughs> Now, we were taking a few moments to get into the book of Colossians, going through it verse by verse, but it was getting kind of hard to do both in one episode. I felt like I wasn't really doing the text justice. Many times just trying to cram it in there and still have room for the headliner, so to speak. So I've decided to make Colossians its own headliner. So we'll set aside a whole episode just for that. Also, I wanted to let you know that your contributions have helped to provide teaching materials to Mabula Baptist Church in Tororo, Uganda. A link to their Facebook page is in the details section of this page. The church is pastored by Athino Isaac. I've come to get to know him over the past few months, and his passion to preach the Word of God to his congregation is inspiring. They're a Reformed Baptist church, which in Uganda is about as rare as hen's teeth. For the past several months, they've been having to meet outside due to coronavirus, but they're meeting, and Brother Athino is preaching the Word diligently every Sunday. When I asked him what he was most desperately in need of, he told me teaching materials. That gives you an idea of where his heart is. But we're also supporting the Bible Mission Baptist Church in Myanmar. This church is shepherded by a super sweet and humble man of God, Pastor Thomas. And by man of God, I mean in the biblical sense. He preaches God's word faithfully to the flock uh, that God has given him. These are two faithful men who have a passion uh, for the Lord and his work and his word. They have a passion to feed God's people. They have a heart to bring the true gospel to the lost of their communities. This in stark contrast to David Crank. <clears throat> if you'll remember, we looked at his wife, Pastor Nicole Crank, a couple of weeks ago. Today we'll be looking at the other half and we'll be examining his gospel of, well, for lack of a better descriptor, Peter Panism. And I want to talk to you today about the God of the comeback. Everybody shout it with me. The God of the comeback. Again, one more time. What? The God of the comeback. I woke up here in the promised land of Florida a couple days ago, and I heard the Lord say this. He said, preach Tuesday night and this weekend about the God of the comeback. I'll be at Sunset Hills this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. God will be at Sunset Hills this weekend, Saturday and Sunday? Oh, you're, you're talking about you. I thought God was still talking. Okay, so apparently God told him to preach this message to us. We should all listen to it, shouldn't we? And listen very carefully. Thus we shall. I want to set this up right and let you know that everybody likes a good comeback. Anybody ever seen a game that it didn't like like they were going to win the basketball game and then all of a sudden out of nowhere? Yeah, we get it. We had a comeback, or a football game had a comeback, or a fight for that matter had a comeback. Anybody ever had a fight yourself, maybe with your wife, and it looked like you were losing, and then all of a sudden you had a comeback? Can I get an amen, right? Is that appropriate? They're desperate to make people laugh, these preachers. 
So <laughs> the God of the comeback. So January, February, March, April, May, June, and here, you know, we're the first, you know, few days of June, July. Uh, so many people thought, well, it's over. Guess my banner year is not going to happen. I thought I was going to get married. I thought for sure this is my year for a breakthrough, man. I still haven't even found a man yet. Listen, God can still do it. You can be like that chick in the back. Come on, somebody. Running up to the front. It's not over till it's over. Look at your neighbor and say, it's not over. Hey, Dimitri, it's not over. He's, he's, he's drinking out of the toilet. So, so what's not over? My, my banner year. I didn't even know I was supposed to be having a banner year. So what's my banner year? It's it's just whatever you want, you know. That's what they mean by that. As long as it's not unbiblical, you can have it. If you want it, and the Bible doesn't say you shouldn't have it, then it must be God putting that little dream in your heart. Now, that's what they mean when they say things like this. It's not over. Nothing is over! Nothing! You just don't turn it off. So realize that God can do more in a few moments, time than you could ever do in a lifetime. And, and by the way, so you put your faith on it. You put your faith on it like magic pixie dust. <laughs> it's been a phenomenal year for a lot of people at our church. In fact, this weekend on the God of the Comeback, I'm going to show you different people at our church who have got crazy uh, debt cancellations that have happened this year. Several people at our church has received a million dollars in government loans for their companies. Yeah. They didn't need it because their business is still going like crazy. And they got the money. So they said, well, I guess I'll just pay my staff and we'll put the rest in the bank. And they got those debts canceled. Even our church got $800,000 from the government. And so we paid our staff and we couldn't fire anybody. You took money from the government for your church? And I, I got one of those too. A lot of people did. It was a loan to pay your employees during the shutdown. If you paid the money to them, you didn't have to pay the loan back. Uh, lots of people got those. A lot of unbelievers got those. So I think you might be overselling the miracle just a bit. Uh, why don't you just preach the gospel? And also, now, now did you say they took the money even though they didn't need the money to pay their employees? And then what was left over they put in the bank? Now, that's actually called stealing, Pastor. Um, it's called fraud. But, but at the end of the day, who would have ever thunk it, right? That the government would pay that. We got people at our church that have been laid off and they only made $700 a week, but the government's paying them $900. i am just not, I'm just telling you that I, I don't understand it all. All I know is you need to get in on it in July and August and September and October and November and December and shout, I serve a God of a comeback and it's about to turn around in my favor. And what didn't kill me is going to make me stronger. Shout amen to that right now. That's a quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, the godless atheist philosopher. So no, I'm not going to amen Friedrich Nietzsche. The God of the comeback. So you get what you believe. You get what you believe. Huh? I never knew that. I hear people all the time say, well, it sure is hard for me to lose weight. I look at a donut and gain 10 pounds. Anybody ever heard people say that? No, I've never heard anyone say that. We're just messing around until he gets to a text of God's word. If, if you're wondering what I'm doing. The Bible says this. He said, we're snared by the words of our mouth. We eat good by the fruit of our lips. And we have not because we ask not. In other words, we're expecting the wrong thing. In other words, you've just taken three pieces of three verses and mashed them all together. Did, did God tell you to do that? Uh, let's see if we can pull these pieces of God's word apart and see what God is actually saying to us. The Bible says this. He said, we're snared by the words of our mouth. Now that's Proverbs 6. My son, if you become surety for your friend, if you have shaken hands in pledge for a stranger, you are snared by the words of your mouth. It's not really teaching like negative confession. It's saying that if you sign a promissory note for your neighbor, or you put up collateral for his loan, you have committed yourself to the completion of the note. Uh, you've made a vow. And as the Bible teaches over and over again, we should keep the vows that we make. Now, the writer here is addressing his son, and we know that Jesus is the wise son of the book of Proverbs. Did you know that we have been given surety or collateral on a promissory note made by the wise son of Proverbs? Uh, Paul says this uh, surety or collateral is the Holy Spirit. 
It's just a cool little thing there in the book of Proverbs. The Holy Spirit is the surety of the promise that we are justified, that we are being sanctified. See, the Holy Spirit is making sure that the work gets done and that we will one day be glorified with Christ, just as he promised. We eat good by the fruit of our lips. That's Proverbs 13. A wise son heeds his father's instruction. Again, the wise son who heeds his father's instruction. That would be Jesus. But a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. We would not hear his rebukes. A man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the unfaithful feeds on violence. Jesus spoke to us. He spoke the words of his father, and he did no violence. But his words provoked us to violence, didn't they? We killed him for his words. He is the wise son. We are the fools, the foolish enemies of God. He who guards his mouth preserves his life. But he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. You know, we shot out the lip at him, cursed him, mocked him, ridiculed him. And he opened not his mouth, you see. So this proverb isn't really about positive confession. It's about the wise son of Proverbs who came to the earth to give his life for fools. And we have not because we ask not. Uh, that's James 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So James says they have desires for pleasure. They have dreams. They've been told by pastors like this, pastors like Joel Osteen and Stephen Furtick and T.D. Jakes, that if you have a desire in your heart, then the Bible doesn't say anything against it, then it's from God. I want to get married. The Bible speaks well of marriage, therefore God is telling me I'm going to get married. I want to make more money at work so I can give more to those in need. The Bible says it's good to desire to give to those in need, therefore it's God's will that I make more money at work. Uh, we can make ourselves believe that all manner of things in our hearts is God speaking to us. And it doesn't help that we have pastors who are telling us that these things in our hearts are indeed God speaking to us. It's ironic because a major theme in James' epistle is the issue of unqualified teachers usurping authority in the church. Unqualified teachers who, for instance, don't understand the things James is writing in his letter to the church. Some people are expecting Corona to shut their business down. Other people are saying, I'm expecting Corona to actually lift my business up. And that has to be from God, right? I mean, why on earth would God not want what I want? And James tells us we ask and do not receive because we ask wrongly. Well, how does one ask rightly? James goes on to say by asking with the caveat, if thy will be done, or if it be thy will. This is the teaching on prayer in the New Testament to pray for God's will to be done. James taught it, all the apostles taught it, Jesus taught it. God works all things together for the good of them that love the Lord and are, and are called according to his purpose. So I wanna, before I get to the text, and it's good enough. So what's his purpose, pastor? He says in the next verse, for those he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's purpose, that's God's will, that's what we should be praying for. So when you're, you get what you expect. So if you expect a little, you get a little. If you expect a lot, you get a lot. You get what you expect. They're all amening this like it's something God said or something. It's not, but they don't care. They don't need the Bible. All they need is that little sprinkling of pixie dust in the heart. But God said, I'm able to do exceedingly abundantly more than you could expect. In other words, unexpected. In other words, that's Ephesians 3.20. It's about bringing salvation to the Gentiles, calling a people from every nation, race, tribe, and tongue into his family. Uh, seriously, that's what it's about. I don't know if this pastor thinks that's worth mentioning or not. So I got a real life story to tell you right here. Uh, apparently, he doesn't think it's worth mentioning. He's going to give us a life story. We'll fast forward through it until we get to a text of God's word. This chapel that we're sitting in right now is a beautiful piece of property in a very incredible place. As you know, it's a local call here to talk to God because he lives here in Florida. <laughs> and uh, palm trees and everything. And I was preaching in our church, and some of you have heard this story before, but this is a part here you haven't heard. Um, and I was just saying because I said, we need a place to broadcast when I am in Florida, pastoring the church on Tuesday night. I couldn't preach in St. Louis. So I need a place to go and, and preach on Tuesday night. So, so we're about to get an office. Notice I'm prophesying, predicting my future. We're about to get an office. It has a room that, that maybe seats 100 people in the office. And some guy walks up to me after the second week of saying that in Florida and says, and it's a long story about I bought a church and it has a room that seats 120 and another room that seats 120. And I told me what I said, so you wouldn't have to work that building. And I was like, is the Pope Catholic? I want that building. I'm going to pray. So he gave us the building. 
Then I just went to dinner with them. They had given us the church, but they still owed like a million dollars on it. What in a famine, in Corona, in a setback, God can do the unexpected. What are you expecting? Are you expecting like that girl to lose? Are you going to start running up and saying, you know what? I was expecting the pastor of this church to preach God's word to me. <laughs> Sorry. Did I scare you? See, I can yell too. Uh, this is not taught in the word of God to expect these kinds of things. We are taught to expect God to keep his promise, to save us from our sins, to sanctify us by his Holy Spirit, and to glorify us together with Christ on the last day. This is what all the writers of New Testament scripture told us to expect. And that's all they told us to expect, except suffering. Uh, they told us to expect that, too. They tell us that a lot, <laughs> a lot, uh, but not this preacher. He's telling us to expect good things here in this life, to expect to be able to fly to Neverland. If it's in your heart, go for it. It's God's will. How could it not be God's will? This is my year to be free. This is my year to be healed. This is my year to overcome. Come on, somebody. I'll give you 10 seconds to praise him. Come on, something else. Now, he left out the gospel there in his little fit he just pitched. Uh, let's look at Ephesians 3.20. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Now, as we've covered, covered before, when Paul talks about the mystery, he's talking about what was narrated to us in the Old Testament being revealed in Christ through his apostles given authority to teach all that Christ commanded. Now, the Old Testament was given to whom? Not to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. <clears throat> Christ sent his apostles where? First to Jerusalem, and then to every nation, race, tribe, and tongue to explain the mystery, to teach the gospel to them. So Paul is not talking about hitting the jackpot at Herod's. He's not talking about meeting that man or woman of your dreams. He's not talking about overcoming Corona. He's talking about the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ, which is overcoming the whole world, every nation, race, tribe, and tongue. Paul is talking about the gospel of Christ here, and that is all he is talking about. And if you say he's talking about something other than that, you are adding words to the scripture, and you are then, by definition, a false teacher. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, what is that? What is Paul referring to? It's not magic pixie dust. It's not the key to a perfect marriage. It's not that million dollar check. It's the manifold revelation of the mystery. It's the gospel revealed to all peoples. The grace of God dispensed among all nations, tribes and tongues, not just the Jews. This is what Paul is saying. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. To the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to all creation by the church or those who have faith in Christ. Now, what does God mean by wisdom? Wisdom is spoken of all throughout scripture in conjunction with righteousness. Wisdom, scripturally speaking, is the word of God. Now, how are we made righteous? Through the word of God. This is about making us righteous, making a righteous people in the earth, here in this wicked, unrighteous earth. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. 
It was all in Christ. The whole mystery is revealed in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now there Paul is talking about suffering again. Suffering, he says, produces something. What does it produce? That go get em attitude at the board meeting? The chutzpah to ask that girl out on a date? The fortitude to apply for that business loan? No, to appreciate Christ, his love for us, us, which is beyond comprehension. Now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Now, it's true God can do anything, but when Paul says he can do abundantly more than we ask or think here, He's saying it in the context of what he's been talking about through this entire chapter. It's his closing to the section of this letter. God is making sinners righteous, and that is abundantly more than we can ask or think. If you think it's not abundantly more than we can ask or think, you don't know the righteousness of God, and you don't know your own sin. He's making me, a wicked, sinful, blasphemous hater of God, into the righteousness of God. Who would have ever thought that? Who would have ever imagined that? Who would have ever expected that? I know we've taken a lot of time away from David Crank here. I don't know if Ephesians 3.20 was his text or just something he was throwing out there. I didn't mean to take up so much time with God's word, but David wasn't really saying anything anyway. Well, let's, let's get back to him now. Listen, I was, I was so freaked out by it. I jumped up, ran over and kissed the man. He's uh, still telling his story. Here's what I'm saying though. When I went to dinner with the guy, God can do the impossible. What I didn't think was going to happen. Somebody ought to shout amen. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus asking how he could inherit eternal life? Jesus said, obey the commandments. The young man said, I do this. Jesus, Jesus said, sell all you have, give it to the poor and follow me. The young man walked away sorrowfully. <clears throat> Jesus said to his disciples, see, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of an eagle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, his disciples didn't rejoice at this. In fact, this terrified them. They said, Lord, who then is able to enter into the kingdom of God? I mean, if this guy can't make it, he's a moral man obeying the laws of God. He's an influential man. He has power. He has money. If this guy doesn't have what it takes, who does? Then Jesus said, with man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, when Jesus said this, he wasn't saying it to have us believe that if we'll just want that million dollar check enough, God will make it possible. After all, this man, this young man, had maybe millions of dollars, and Jesus told him to get rid of it and follow it. Jesus wasn't saying, if you just keep updating your profile on Match.com, God will make the impossible possible, and that right person will come along. Jesus wasn't saying that if you keep applying for that college scholarship, you'll finally get it. He's talking about salvation from our sins, eternal life in his name. It is God who makes it possible, and only God. And that's what the angel told Mary when Mary asked, how can she bear the Messiah when she's not known a man? It is God who makes salvation possible. Because as the angel said, he came to save his people from their sins, not to give them job promotions and million dollar checks. Now, again, I'm, I'm taking up a lot of David's time here, so we'll get back to him now. It's still your year. Look at your neighbor and say, it's still your year. Hey, Brad, it's your year. Cool. Look back at him and say, I know you, you, you got blessed because you got to sit by me tonight. Hey, Brad. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. It says, Now it happened when David and his men came from Ziklag. I love that word, Ziklag. 
On the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south of Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken all the captivity, taken all the women and the children, uh, small and great. They didn't kill anyone. Everybody shout, that's good. But they carried them all away. And, and, and so David and his men came back to the city of Ziklag. And when they came back home, the entire town was burned down with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken. And they loved these people. It'd be different if you didn't love your wife. But how many of you this is probably you come home? And the wife is gone. Your kids are gone. Your house is burnt down. Everything had been destroyed. I'm sure it was wonderful. Uh, they're desperate for laughs, these guys. Some people during COVID, this has happened to you. Some people just in a season of life and it, it's not COVID related at all, but you're in a season where you look like the city is burned down. The dream is in shambles. What dream? I, I'm still waiting for one of these dream preaching pastors to show me a passage of scripture that tells me that I, as a believer in Christ, uh, should have some kind of dream that I should pursue come hell or high water. It doesn't look like it was going to happen. But again, we don't look at way things appear. We actually prophesy our preferred future. Somebody shout hallelujah to this. Somebody shout. I've never read that in the Bible. <laughs> I've read it in Peter Pan, though, and pretty much every other fairy tale and movie of the week. I've heard heretics teach it, too. Heretics like Ken Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, E.W. Kenyon, Joel Osteen, and Benny Hinn. I never read it in the Bible, though. You know, the book God wrote. Then David and the men that were with him, they lifted up their voices and they wept until they had no power to weep again. Anybody ever done an ugly cry? God, I just don't even understand. How in the world is... Quiet, you awful man. It happened to me. Let's try this again right now. Anybody ever had an ugly cry? I can't believe it. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. Look at... I'm sure David and his men would have found this hilarious, don't you? You look at yourself in the mirror, girls, and your mascara's running. You're like, my God. You know better than that. You ought not say that word. I look horrible because this is exactly the picture I'm painting for you. Remember in Ephesians 3 when Paul was talking about the mystery of the Old Testament revealed in Christ? Remember how much he talked about Christ in that short passage? This preacher hasn't said anything about Christ. He's not going to preach Christ from this passage. He's going to preach Peter Pan. But we're not supposed to be looking for Peter Pan in this passage. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus. Is he here? Is he here in this passage? Well, let's see. But, but now remember, this is the mystery we're looking at. It, it's like a picture or a shadow, as Paul called it. It's not going to look exactly like him. But we will be able to see him here in a kind of dim reflection, in a way that those living out these events could not see. So, so let's look at it, knowing what we know about Christ. Verse 1, it says, now it happened when David and his men came from Ziklag. So this is David, a forerunner of Jesus, and at times a kind of type of Jesus. Now, not at all times, obviously, but in certain acts, and in terms of typology and in category. Now, David is king of Israel, king of the Jews. When we look at the kings of Israel, we are looking at an office that Christ will fill. So all the kings are, in a sense, representative of him, uh, but less than him, uh, so much less than him. Uh, some more lesser, uh, is that a word, lesser? Uh, some more lesser of him than others. But they're all part of a, the lineage of types and shadows from which the true king of Israel will come. So here's the king of the Jews, but he's not been crowned king yet. He's been anointed, but not crowned. He's kind of a renegade king, hounded by Saul, hounded by his enemies. It sounds kind of like what happened to Jesus, right? Not exactly like Jesus, but it's not supposed to sound exactly like Jesus. It's a shadow, a mystery. On the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south of Ziklag. On the third day. Now, that's pretty significant in Bible typology. Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale. The leftover food from sacrifices to God could be kept for two days, but on the third day, they had to be burned up. Uh, Joseph kept his brothers in prison for three days. The Jews fasted for three days before Esther went in to plead her case before the king. Uh, but, of course, the, the big third day is the day Christ rose from the dead. Now, this three days here in this story is three days after David and his men began their journey home from Aphek, where David had allied himself with the Philistines who were at war with Israel. So it's not a perfect picture of Jesus. Uh, David is allying himself with the enemies of God's people. Now, we don't insert ourselves into the story. We, we don't pattern our lives after these people. 
Uh, we certainly don't pattern our lives after David. He committed uh, some very egregious sins and was pretty awful at times. No, our lives are patterned after Jesus, so we look for him there. Um, think of it kind of like this. David is playing a role that he doesn't really know that he's playing. We're looking back on his activities as one who knows the full script, so to speak. And so we can see where David comes close to the mark of the role he's playing and where he's off and where he's way off. So David was sent home because the Philistine king didn't trust David to stay loyal to him. So David and his men traveled three days to get back to their families only to find this. And burned it with fire and taken all the captivity, taken all the women and the children, uh, small and great. Their families had been taken captive, taken captive by an enemy, the family of the king. Get it? They lifted up their voice and they wept until they had no power to, to weep any longer. And they wept. They wept until they had no power to weep any longer. Now, this was some serious weeping. This was anguish of soul. Uh, doesn't this remind you of Gethsemane and our Lord? It reminds David Crack of a woman's uh, mascara running. And David and his, and his wives, Abigail, the widow, they go on to list it. It says, now David was greatly distressed. I want you to shout that, greatly distressed. Come on, class. Now let's talk about stress. There's stress, and then anybody ever been greatly distressed? Uh, yes, I've been greatly distressed. I'm getting a little distressed right now listening to this. Like, oh my gosh, I am greatly distressed. This is where they're at. They're greatly distressed. Now, I want to pause here and say this about a lot of church people. And I've been saying it for a while. We can't let what's out there get in here. The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He said that we're not supposed to allow our carnal mind to be uh, overtaken by the news media, basically. It said, take heed what you hear. So if you watch CNN, continuous negative news, and you go over to the Republican channel, Fox News, and then they got all their stuff over here, and you got MSNBC, you got a 24-hour news cycle, and it's bad news, and you'll go from distress to greatly distress. Um, I think that's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. He isn't citing the passage, so who knows? It sounds kind of like it. Uh, let's, let's read it in the King James. I just love how it sounds. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that's about us being humble and obedient, not really about stress at all. I just, I just, I just don't know what you're talking about, David. Jesus humbled himself into death, even death on a cross. Therefore, I'm supposed to turn off Fox News and CNN? But I'm saying tonight, God, this God of the turnaround, this God of the breakthrough, this God of taking from the back of the race and accelerating you to the front of the race is not up to God. Yep, that's what he said. It's not up to God. God highly exalted Jesus in Philippians 2. We just read that. I don't know what this preacher's getting at, but I don't like it. His hand is not shortened tonight. That's a reference to Isaiah 59.1 about the gospel of Christ, which we have not heard from this preacher yet. He hasn't forgot how to get water out of a rock. Paul said the rock is a type or shadow of Christ Jesus. Jesus, you know, the name that is above every name. The name that every knee will bow to and every tongue confess. Yet we haven't heard this preacher confess his name yet, have we? Not once. How to drop manna from heaven. Uh, that's Jesus too. Uh, John chapter 6 says this. Why does this preacher have such a hard time talking about Jesus or even saying his name? He knows exactly what he's doing, but you're watching the wrong news. You need to watch the good news. Come on, somebody shout it. And the Bible says, take heed what you hear. I'm trying. I really am. I'm trying to hear about Jesus here, the name that is above every name. It's why I came to church this morning, but I'm not hearing it. I came here to actually hear the good news of the gospel, but I'm not hearing that either. Yes, look at your neighbor and say, I know what your problem is now. I figured it out. You listen to too much news. Hey, Brad, I know what your problem is now. Enough talk. 
greatly distressed. And now the people speak of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughter. But I love this part. But David did what? He strengthened himself in the Lord. He wanted to stone Jesus too, many times. And Jesus strengthened himself in the Lord. Seriously, read Psalm 22. David wrote it about Jesus. Uh, that's the David in the Bible. Uh, not this David. Not Pastor David Crank. Uh, he doesn't uh, talk about Jesus. Now I wish somebody could work out for me, but I have to work out for myself. Yeah. St. Louis has got it really quiet in Florida right now. Let's try it again. <laughs> you got to work out for yourself. Right. You got to pray for yourself. You can't go, I want Christina and Rodney and all the team in St. Louis to praise God. For Pastor Jordan, get up there and make me happy. No, you have to do it yourself. Oh, well, right, because it's not up to God. That verse in Hebrew is better translated as David found strength in the Lord. So, oh, I get it, though. This is where we prophesy our preferred future. Now, if we're looking at this narrative through the lens of the gospel, who are we in this scenario? Are we David? No. We're the people carried off into slavery whom David is going to rescue. If this pastor wanted to teach believers how to live in times of suffering, why didn't he go to a New Testament passage on the subject? One written to believers in Christ by those Christ appointed to teach believers in Christ all that he commanded. Because those passages teach us over and over again that when we suffer, we grit our teeth and bear it. We find strength in the Lord to endure, not to conquer. But people don't like to hear that. They really don't. They'd rather pretend they're David, pretend they're Peter Pan. We like to pretend we're other people. David, Moses, Joseph, Peter Pan, LeBron James. Anybody but Jesus. We don't want to pretend to be like Jesus, not him. That's why God has to make us like him. We won't do it ourselves. We couldn't do it ourselves even if we wanted to. You're about as happy as you want to be. I don't like that. Come on right now. You're about as happy as you want to be. And so you're overcome. And David said, even though, even though my team is saying we want to kill him, they thought he was great two days ago, and now they want to kill him. But he encouraged himself in the Lord. In other words, you go into a room, maybe tomorrow on Wednesday, getting ready for Thursday and Friday, and then Saturday, the live at five, when I come back in St. Louis and preach and stream around the world, and you need to maybe turn off the negative news and just try this. Try to get that second win that that chick had in that race and go, I'm going to try something on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I'm going to turn off the social media. I'm going to turn off the negative news. I'm going to turn off all secular stuff because if, if how many of y'all pretty sure that all hell will break loose every day between now and Sunday? I don't think David turned off the negative news. I don't think he was sitting there looking at the ashes of his home, his kids' toys scattered about, pictures of his wife broken on the floor, his men screaming for his blood going, I see nothing. This is like some kind of New Age Buddhism this guy's teaching, a Christian scientism, a Peter Panism. It's just going to happen. There's going to be everything in the world going on between now and then. But there's all kinds of crap. That you know better than that. You ought not say that word. It happens that you don't even know happened if you turn off the news and you turn on the word and you go, oh, I thank you, Lord. It says I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. And everything my hand touches turns to good. That's Deuteronomy 28. I check out the whole chapter sometime. David Crank doesn't want his people checking out the chapter, though, because they'll read it and find out that he's not telling them the whole truth. I know that God's going to work all things together for my good. If you love God, if you are called according to his purpose. For those he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. That's how that verse goes. Now, the good here is to be conformed into the image of Christ. Not David, not Peter Pan, Christ. But we don't want to be conformed into his image. Not when we look at him. Because he didn't really conquer in this life. Wasn't really a winner. Didn't really get his turnaround, did he? Not in this life. And neither will we. Now, that's what his apostles teach us. That's not what this pastor is teaching us. He can't even quote a Bible verse correctly. Can't even tell you where it is in the Bible, so you'll see that he's not quoting it correctly. He's hiding things from you, this pastor. 
what can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, height, death, things, presence, things to come. No, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. He jumbled that passage up and mixed it all together so that you'd hear it the way he wanted you to hear it. Let's look at the passage. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In all these things, not through all these things, not over these things, in all these things, through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These things cannot separate you from his love. Nothing can. No thing can separate you from him who joined himself to you. If you've got COVID-19, it can't separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've lost your business, it can't separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you've lost your family, it can't separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you know that Christ loves you, you can endure anything, anything. David knew this. Paul knew it. I'm beginning to know it. You know it. Pastor David Crank doesn't know it. So God, I praise you today because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That's from Psalm 139. It's about the sovereignty of God over all things. <clears throat> it pretty much says that everything is in fact up to God. God, I think with long life you'll satisfy me and show me your salvation. That's Psalm 91. It's the prophecy of Jesus. He's still alive, you know, still saving people from their sins. God, I know that you said in Psalms 103 and 3, he sent his word and healed them and delivered from all, A-double-L, -L, all their diseases. That means COVID-19, COVID-2020, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Come on, somebody ought to shout amen. Your God knows exactly what you need right now. Psalm 103, 3, he who forgives all your iniquities, he who heals all your diseases. This pastor didn't mention iniquities, didn't mention sin. Now, I wonder why that is. And he said that 2020 was your jubilee. It is your banner year. It is time for debts to be canceled. For Come on, somebody right now. For prisoners to be released. Are you going to stay negative? Are you going to pull yourself up and go, I got this. I'm coming around the bend. And I'm going to finish strong because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Now, that's 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, when you read about what the false prophets were teaching in the Old Testament, most of them were teaching prosperity. Seriously, it's what the Bible says. They were proclaiming peace when there was no peace. Proclaiming victory when there was no victory. Just a little side note there. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Have we heard David Crank confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? Have we heard him say anything about Jesus at all? And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Antichrist. Lots of talk about that these days. John says it's always been around. The word literally means against Christ. There are people in the world who are against Christ. Is David Crank for or against Christ? Who knows? He won't talk about it. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Overcome them, those who are against Christ. Not COVID-19, not your business ventures, not your distress, those who are against Christ. This is what the passage says that David Crank just threw out there as a paraphrase. Come on, somebody give him praise tonight. Be blessed. If I got COVID, you got it now. Spit all over you. Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Does, does that sound like something Jesus would have said? Verse 7 says, Then David said, Tabitha the priest, 
He said, please bring me the ephod here. In other words, I need to pray the prayer ephod. So David inquired of the Lord saying, shall we pursue the troop and overtake them? Notice direction and correction comes from God. So he says, I'm going to put on this ephod. I'm going to go to church on Tuesday night. God, give me direction. So this wasn't really dragging yourself out to go to church on Tuesday. This, this was the garment of the priest. David is going to serve as a priest for his men, for his family, his captured family. And since God is speaking to him, David is serving here as a prophet, a prophet, a priest, and a king. Who does that remind you of? It doesn't remind me of me. <laughs> nope, not even close. It reminds me of Jesus, our perfect prophet, priest, and king, who came to us and only spoke the words of God as a perfect prophet, who mediates between God and us through the perfect atoning sacrifice he made on the cross as a perfect priest and who sat down at the right hand of the Father to reign eternally over all things as a perfect king. And, and the Lord answered him and said, pursue, everybody shout pursue. Everybody shout, let's listen to Jesus' prayer in John 17. He prayed this just before he went to the cross, just before he engaged in this rescue mission for lost, captured sinners. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I want you to shout it three times, what? Pursue, pursue, pursue. What are you gonna do in the rest of 2020? Pursue your miracle, pursue your breakthrough, pursue your dreams, pursue everything that God said you could have. Pursue. God said we could have him, that we could know him through Christ Jesus, the one he sent to rescue us. This is what Jesus said in his prayer. This is not what David Crank is saying. D does anything David Crank is saying sound like anything Jesus would say? Anything Jesus said? No, it sounds more like Antichrist to me. If God... If you put it in the book, you ought to just get it. It doesn't belong to me. Let's just listen to the rest of Jesus' prayer. It's a prayer not only for his disciples, but for us, those who would come to believe in him through their testimonies. I'm, I'm tired, you know. I'm tired of listening to this foolish man. I want to listen to Jesus. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, Keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition. <sighs> that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you. And these things I speak in the world, 
that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Wow, what a prayer. We did not know him. We did not know God, but, but Jesus knew him for all eternity. And he came to us so that we might know him. Wow. Uh, well, why can't we talk about that? Why, why can't we talk about that in church? Why can't our preachers preach that to us? Th these things they're saying, they don't even sound like the things Jesus said. He came and gave us the words of God. That, that's what he said in his prayer. Uh, why can't we hear those in church? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I know this. He loves me. He said so in his prayer. Now, did you hear his love for us in his prayer? I can endure anything knowing that Jesus loves me like that. Anything. COVID-19, lawlessness in the streets, job loss, family loss, Republican in the White House, Democrat in the White House, death, disease, loneliness. He loves me. He loves me. Me. And that is so much more than I could have ever imagined or thought or expected. God bless. Y'all take care. And I'll talk to you again soon.